Hey everyone, so thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, it is a privilege and pleasure to have Rabbi Yosef Dweck with us tonight. Uh, Rabbi Dweck is the Senior Chief Sephardi Rabbi of the Sephardi and Portuguese Community of the United Kingdom, and personally it is an honor to be able to call him my rabbi. We live in a world where there is a lot of Torah content. There is much detail. We have many yeshivot, many people attending them. We have shirim everywhere. We have pavrutot. We have everything. All content, Torah content, is available to us. Yet there is a sense that the beauty, the sophistication, the cutting edgeness of Torah is lacking. And this is because while there is a lot of content, while there is a lot of details, the framework, the context, is missing. Rabbi Dweck is someone who, while teaching and giving over the details, is able to also provide the context and the framework for those details and express the beauty and the relevance and sophistication of Torah to each and every one who he meets. Um, my love for Torah and the love of Torah of a lot of people in this room is attributable to Rabbi Dweck, and I would like to thank him for that from the bottom of our hearts, and may he be able to continue sharing the beauty and the light of Torah to many more people in many more years. Um, a big thank you to the yeshiva for hosting and the platforms program. Uh, tonight's shiur has been sponsored by Abe Saivich, our good friend, Leilu Nishmat, his grandmother, Luna Bat Reina, who passed away a few days ago. May her Nishma have an aliyah. Tonight is also dedicated to the Rafash Lema of Anael Bat Rivka, a premature baby who has had two blood transfusions. May Hashem provide her a full refua and her parents' strength during these difficult times. Thank you all for coming, and thank you so much, Rabbi Thank you. Uh, I don't know if it's everybody that I meet, but uh, thank you for the words. And um, I'm just very grateful to have an opportunity to share with all of you tonight. I really am very grateful that all of you have come tonight uh, to share some of your Torah. It's, uh, it's a privilege for me to be able to, uh, to spend this time with you when I'm just passing through Miami. Um, but I did want to share with you tonight really just one thought. It's not, it's not really complex. And, um, and it is, I do think, a principle. I do think it's a principle that is helpful. And whatever it is that I say, when I say I think it's helpful, it's because what I experience in my own life to be helpful. So, uh, you know, I, so I, I, I only share it with you from that context. And you will decide whether it's helpful for you or not. But I offer it to you as a share. Um, Asaf, if I stand up, is that going to be a problem? No. Okay, so I'm going to stand up. So, um, we're reading Parashat Vaikra. We're reading Parashat Vaikra. It's Shabbat. And it comes out that we read it before Purim. So I wanted to think about, I wanted to talk with you about something having to do with, with the parasha, and really just the very beginning of the parasha, because I do think that it is so fundamental. It brings something out to us that is so fundamental to our lives and how it is that we relate to everything. And when I say everything, I really mean everything. And there's a very famous issue with the beginning of the parasha, and that is the first word, and that is written weird, right? There's the small aleph. Everybody knows about this, everybody talks about this, everybody has a drash about this. I want to think about it with you a bit. Rashi is also very famous on that, obviously, because if everybody's talking about that, they're going to want to know what Rashi says. Right? So, who can tell me what Rashi says on this? It's two different, two different Rashi. There are two different Rashi. So tell me them. Uh, you can choose which one you want to say, um, if you wish to. Yeah, let's see. The first one was. Um, I'm not testing everyone. It's okay. It's a, I don't want to just did it. Uh, last time, right? All right, it's okay. It happens to me all the time. Very often, actually. I I I, could, I empathize with you. The first Rashi says that this was done all the time, right? This wasn't just here. Yeah, should we read it? Let's read it. Right, what did Rashi say? He says, yes, it's included in it. 
He says, בכל דברות, בכל מרות, בכל ציוויים, קדמה קריאה. To every, every speaking situation that God spoke to Moshe, it was preceded by this kriya. So even though it doesn't explicitly say it every single time in Torah, you can assume that that's how it started. Right? So anytime that you see, Vaydaber Adonai Moshe Lemor, Vayomer Hashem El Moshe, you should know that it wasn't an abrupt speaking. There was an invitation. Right? There was a calling to Moshe. Every single time. That's Rashi. Right? Now Rashi's not just Rashi. Rashi's saying, he's, he's talking about a Midrash, Lashon Chazal. And then it says, Lashon Chiba. And what was this? Right? What is the nature of this Kriya? What's the nature of this calling? It's Lashon Chiba. It's, it's affectionate. That's really what Chiba means. So it's, it's an endearing way of speaking. It's affectionate. And then he says, he contrasts it. How does he contrast it? Do you recall? He compares it to something. Yeah? Simcha? What is it? The, the affection? No, he, yeah, he's comparing the Vaikra and the Lashon Chiba and so on to an alternative. Does anybody know the alternative? Sorry? Bilam. Not Amalek, no. Bilam. Bilam, right? That what happens with Bilam? It says, Nevi'eu mota olam nigla lehen belashon arai v'tum'ah. It's interesting that it says when we only see it with one. Right? And it says that by him it's by Kar Elohim the Bilam. By Kar, says Rashi, is what? Arai. Arai means it's haphazard, right? It's not necessarily something that is established, right? It lacks permanence, it lacks establishment, it lacks focus. It's uh, by you know by by passing as we might say. So that's that's how Rashi opens this, and so he's contextualizing this. So before we get back into this, I want to consider something with you, so that we can we can have an idea of how it is that we might deal with this. Yeah. Let's think about the world for a minute. Think about what, what it would mean to have this Kriya, you know, how to live a life where either things are in, in a Kriya type of way or in a Vaikar type of way. Now, recognize that both of those words that Rashi's comparing over here, he's the Vaikra on one side, the Shona Chiba, Vaikar on the other side, the Shona Arai. Uh, one is quite focused, a lot of attention, care. The other one is very unfocused, not a great deal of attention, not a lot of care, right? When we look at these two, these two things, we also know that the words come from two different roots. In Hebrew, the root for vaikar, anyone? Three letters, what are they? Kufresh hey. Kufresh hey, thank you, right? Kara, which simply means happen. Yeah. <coughs> Kara and vaikra with the aleph is kufresh aleph, right? Which is to call, to so the calling, right, already inherently is something that is focused and that I'm intending to do, right? So one of the first times that we see this is if we go all the way back to Bereshit, which is important, because this will help us frame how it is that we look at the world this way. So what's the famous story with regards to the Kriya and Bereshit? With regards to Kriya and Bereshit, Kadosh Baruch Hu wants uh, names for the animals. So what does he do? I'm asking you, what does he do? We're in yeshiva, it's okay, you can answer questions. What, what does he do? Sorry? Close. Close. But no, no cigar. Right? But thank you. Thank you for answering. He doesn't tell that now. What does he do? No. No. Let's look at it. He says, it says in Yeshiva, ויצר אדוני אלוהים מן האדמה כל חיית השדה את כל עוף השמיים ויבא אל האדם So he made all the animals and brought them to the Adam לראות מה יקרא לו What does that mean? What does that mean? To, to see them as though To see מה יקרא לו, what does that mean? He wanted to see, let's see what he's going to call them Right, so he doesn't tell Adam anything He doesn't have to 
All he does is bring the animals to him. Brings the animals to him, see what he's going to call them. Wonder what he's going to call them. Let's see. And what ends up happening is whatever it is that he calls them, whatever it is that he calls them, so that's very interesting. Why do you think that's the case? Why doesn't a Kadosh Baruch? I mean, that, that's what we, we would think. You know, you tell it over, you figure. Kadosh Baruch Hu says, name the animals. He doesn't say name the animals. To the contrary, he specifically does not tell Adam to name the animals. Instead, it says that he wants to see what he's going to call them. Is there a question in HaKadosh Baruch Hu's mind, Kaviachol, that he's not going to call them anything? No. He, that's an assumption. Right? The assumption here is that I'm going to bring him the animals and he's going to call them something. Let's see what he's going to call them. So the assumption, interestingly, is the fact that the human will call names to the animals. What does that tell me about the human? It's, this is, it's, it's fundamental, right? But what, what does it tell me about a fundamental nature of the human being? It seeks to define. It seeks to define. Right. So in another way we could say that, which is exactly exactly accurate, that's correct, right? We are we are beings that seek definitions, right? Are we not? Right? We're beings that seek definitions. So much so that if we don't have definitions to things, we feel terribly uncomfortable, don't we? We like to know what things mean. Which is another way of saying it. Right? Another way of saying it is that human beings want to know what things mean. Would you agree to that? Right? Does that resonate? So it's interesting because the way that, that Torah is presenting it to us is that this is fundamental. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not need to tell Adam to do this. He just needs to wait to see <laughs> what it's going to be. And he doesn't disappoint. Right? It doesn't disappoint. He calls whatever, whatever it is, he calls it the so that's a very interesting point because what it is saying is that inherent in the Adam, right, part of the wiring of the Adam is calling things things. Or as you more sophisticated, right, more sophisticated way of saying is that we want to define. It's inherently wired in us, to f definitions, or to find meaning. So the, the, the big question though is, is that a good thing? Because not all of these things that come with the wiring are necessarily helpful to us in all situations. Right? Do you agree? Do you recognize that? Like, in other words, not everything that we have this drive to do is necessarily best for us in all situations. It might help us in certain situations, but not necessarily in all situations. And there are situations in where we have, uh, you know, wirings or kind of already downloaded stuff in the software to engage in ways that are not always helpful to us. So who can tell me, if you think about it, right, when might this not be helpful? <coughs> Trying to understand God. Well, that's a big one. That's a big one. That's a good leap. That's great. What else? Why, why would you say that that's not helpful? I'm sorry, what's your name? Matthew. Matthew, why, why would you say that's not helpful? Because it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to us outside of time. Again, our brains can't understand that. OK. 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 I hear? I hear? What about something that a little bit, let's take it down a notch, right? When might this be problematic for us? Trying to define negative events. Oh, okay, tell me about that a little bit. That's interesting. Like, some people say, oh, the Shoah happened because of this. Right. So Why do we do that? It helps us feel more comfortable with what happened. So you would say that it, in general, when we have situations in life that are not necessarily calming or easy and so on that kind of make us feel like we are uncomfortable, it helps us to give reasons for them. Right. Right? Are you, would you, yeah. So why would that be problematic? Because you I mean, it makes us feel better. It makes us feel better. You might be doing the, uh, a wrong assessment. And, and therefore, uh, what's the worst that could happen? You miss reality. What is it? You miss reality. So. It will warp your and it's going to warp your perception of reality possibly permanently. And therefore, why is this a problem? It affects your actions. And to not be able to perceive. Wait, wait, you said it affects your actions. Sorry, who's that? Okay. And 
So if you have acting based on wrong perception, then that will directly affect outcomes of your actions. Because, because what? Because what? In other words, what will happen? Tell me what you will do. What will happen? You, if, you, if you make, if you make, take action based on your incorrect assumptions, then it will end up being worse for you, worse for other people. Because finish that out, round that out. Because Why will it be worse? What will what will be the issue? Bad things will happen to you if you. Why is that? Because you made assumptions based on things that were incorrect, and the world doesn't work in an incorrect oh, way. It doesn't work, right? So they're thinking. So. We recognize that it is important for us to be able to figure out as best we can what's really going on, because if we behave uh, with the world thinking that it is other than what is actually going on, we get we could potentially get hurt as a result of that. It could be negative for us in serious ways, sometimes less serious ways. Sometimes we'll continue doing it until it's so serious that we can't help but not do it anymore, but we will often engage in doing it until it doesn't matter. Everybody with me so far? We're on? Okay. So this is interesting because that indicates that my, my human uh, propensity that is assumed, right, in the beginning of Torah is just the way that I, this is the way that I do the world as a human being, is to call names, right, is to define, is to find meaning, right, there's, all, there's levels of doing this, is so much there that I will do that primarily, but it doesn't mean that I will do it well. Yeah, so when it's with animals, right, maybe that's not such a big deal. Yeah, because who should, well, God, he's okay, we'll, we'll take that name, you know, that's fine, we'll take that name. Because it's the way that you relate to it, right? So when it's just the way that you relate to it, but it doesn't necessarily have realistic implications in major ways, right? Well, okay, we can manage that, you can have that. But we do recognize that our propensity to do that, right, to constantly find definitions and meaning could be quite... Dangerous, actually. Could I get into a situation of dangerous? Right. So, what might be the antidote to this? Sorry. What is it? What's the question? What might be the antidote to getting into those problems, and where I realize, as a human being, I have such a tendency to define things. I mean, more than I mean, this happens unconsciously. We will do this without. We don't, it's not like every time that we find a reason or define something, we sit there you know, with a cup of coffee to think about what's going on. We, we, the brain does this automatically, right? So, recognizing that's the case, what might help us humility. when, what might help us mitigate that, right? Humility. That's a very broad and abstract well, term. if I'm understanding you correctly. But I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm just trying to break it down a bit. Refraining from, from doing it. Refraining from doing it, yeah? Completely, not necessarily, but let's, it might help to take a step back to start to train my mind not to define, but rather what? Seeing things the way they are. The best I can. I mean, you know, the way they are is a big, it's a can of worms, can I ask right? A question? And to be inquisitive, right, about it. Accept. There's certain elements of acceptance about it, right? And acceptance, I think that's a, an important one. Acceptance doesn't necessarily mean that you would have to accept it in terms of hook, line, and sinker succumbing to it. But it could simply mean to recognize, OK, this is what I see. What does it mean? I don't know. Well, maybe that's the problem. Wait, who's talking? Yes, sorry, yes. It could be that the issue is, is that you're looking at it through the lens of, this is what I see, as opposed to this is what is object objectively seen by everyone. Right, so what I'm suggesting, I hear what you're saying. And I'm not saying that you're incorrect at all, right? I'm just holding on it because I'm concerned on, about that only for one reason, right? Objectively happening or objectively there is a can of worms. Because what is objective? You have no, not, none of us have any knowledge of what is genuinely, utterly objective. All we ever have is how it is that we experience something. But in the phenomenon <clears throat> of experience, I can, to a degree, suspend my judgment of the experience. Yes? In other words, I can train, it's very difficult. This is not an easy thing to do. It's not like, okay, all of a sudden I turn the faculty off of the Kriyat Shemot. This is so inherent that all God has to do is bring the animals, Lirot Ma'ai Kralo, and we'll see what's gonna do. It's not like God has to tell him to do this. This is an automatic thing. So if I become aware of the fact that the way my mind works is not only to experience the world, but to define it automatically, 
I do find, however, that as a human being, I have a bit of an ability, and it takes a tremendous amount of practice if I want to develop this, right? I have a certain level of ability to be able to just observe and suspend the judgment, suspend the definition, suspend the assertion of meaning. Yes? Now that might be an important thing to hone. So that as I wish, <coughs> I can use it. Because we can also find that we could become actually quite plagued by the de definitions and meaning that we put on things. And when I say we put on things, I don't necessarily mean again, not necessarily voluntarily. So if I have a feeling, let's say I'm feeling sad. What we don't always realize is that there is a difference between a feeling and what meaning I give to the feeling. We just feel sad and believe that sadness means if something's wrong, my life is miserable, whatever the case is. That doesn't go together with sadness. It doesn't have to. I could simply observe that I am feeling sad and question why it is that I'm feeling sad. I could also not question why it is that I'm feeling sad. I could just observe that I'm feeling sad. That is a possibility for human beings. But it is not a net, it's not an automatic. That requires practice. So it might be, it might be valuable to practice that so that I have better choice or control, right, we're going to borrow those terms now for a minute, as to when and how I decide and employ my capacity for meaning and judgment and definition and so on, all basically the same terms for different circumstances. Are you with me? Yeah. Now, that might be helpful to me because it means that, and why did I bring up the emotions, right, as an example, right, because the emotions are also occurrences. I mean, if you think about it, everything that you experience is an occurrence. Your emotions occur. They come and they go. Thoughts occur more often than not, right? More often than not, the thoughts that you have are not chosen by you. They come. And you also have the ability to observe the thoughts and see them come and go. And the same thing happens in the world when you observe it. Things happen, you can observe them, and then they stop happening and then something else happens, yeah? Now, to, to, to a certain degree, that is a more realistic way of living a life. When I say to a certain degree, I'm saying it's not the only realistic way, but it's a bit of a more realistic way because what it does, it suspends your, your constant inclination to define. And we've established that our capacity to define is not fail-proof, right? It's not fail-safe, it doesn't always define things accurately. We know that, right? We have to constantly reassess how it is that we're defining things throughout our lives because we do not, just because Arambam, by the way, a major point that he makes at the beginning of the Morin de Bukhim, over and over and over again to introduce the Morin de Bukhim, is this basic concept. Just because we think does not mean that we think correctly. It's a hard thing for us to gather, right? Because we do normally assume that if I'm thinking something, I'm thinking accurately. <clears throat> so at the very least, the detachment from thought and definition of thought, or experience and definition of experience, helps me to pause between the experience and the definition of the experience, which helps me if I do end up wanting to define to try and define it as accurately as I can. Yeah? Okay. Well, that already tremendously reorients the nature of how it is that most of us live our lives. So let's think about that. So we said, well, what does that mean? It means that we look at the world then, right? We pause and we look at the world as occurrences. Not meaningful occurrences, inherently, Meaning can be suspended. I can discuss that later. I can think of that not necessarily grafted onto the experience. I can experience emotions, thoughts, occurrences without the definition of those emotions, thoughts, and occurrences. Again, very difficult to do. 
It takes a tremendous amount of practice, but it is possible for me to do that. Which means that I relate to the world instead as happenings, which is more in line with which of the first two words that we looked at? What is it? The Vaikar. It's looking at the world, world as a Bikrim. Zekara. What does it mean, Zekara? Lo yodea. Zekara. Mata kore leze. Lo kore. Ani oeshe kara, lo kore. So, Hachamim say that that's how Bilam lived his life. And that's what made him Bilam. He completely detached himself from definitions inherently. Doesn't he say that he didn't apply definitions? But he didn't initially think in terms of definitions. He trained himself to see the world only as it is, without what he thinks it is. And that made him, as far as Chazal were concerned, into a high level thinker. So Chazal actually used the word philosoph, right? Because they knew that word at the time. They said, philosoph gadol haya. Right? He was a major philosopher. Not necessarily the most highly developed philosopher, but in this issue, he made it his business to live his life this way. Now, you're taking that by me just telling it to you. So there's a lot of indication that that's the way <coughs> Well, one of the things that happens when you start to learn to live this way, and again, I'm, I'm simply suggesting that there might be benefits. Yeah, let's remember, Chazal said, like, you know, a Kadosh Baruch who spoke to Bilam like nobody else. Yeah, so there was something going on over there. Chazal said, Moshe had to specifically ask God to stop talking to him. And he says, Ben Iflinu Ani Vamecha, right? He had to literally have to ask, please stop doing this, because this was uh, this occurred. So there was something about the way that he saw the world that helped him, and this was a major part of it. He trained himself to look at the world as happenings, rather than my callings. And that seriously heightened his capacity to think of the world realistically. What it also meant was that things didn't mean much to him, obviously. Right? Because think about how it is that the world presents itself to us. If what I'm saying is true, and you're acknowledging that there's some element of truth to this experience, right? the world does not come to us with definitions. We apply the definitions. Sometimes they're better, sometimes they're worse, but it doesn't come to us that way. <clears throat> and as far as Bilam was concerned, it doesn't come to us that way, and it just isn't that way. So I'm aware of the fact that I might put definitions on things, but they're my definitions and I put them on things. But the things themselves don't come to me that way. <coughs> and that's how he lived in life. And therefore, he didn't have a great deal of inherent meaning. Did this bother him? No. It didn't bother him. It didn't bother him because he was able to live as things were, and that to him was enough. To him, the most important thing was to be completely immersed in the current moment, which is, when you think about it, what else is there? What else do you have? How much of your life do you spend worrying about what's going to happen and thinking and worrying about what has happened? That's a serious question I'm asking you to think about. How much of your life do you spend worrying about what is going to be and concerning yourself with what has, has happened or what you've done. Consider that. Not right now, I mean, you don't have to sit around, just throwing that out there, but really consider how much we spend worrying about what is going to be and what has happened. Now, there might be good, you say to me, well, but there's good reason for that, maybe. <coughs> Always? I don't know. I'll ask you this question. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right, it is important to do that. But at what expense? I'll, I'll add an aspect to that question. To what degree do you spend your life thinking about what, was, what is going to happen or what has happened and lose your now? 
as a result of it. Lose completely what is happening right now. Bilal didn't do that. That's one of the things that made him who he was. Right? He just was completely and utterly immersed in now. He was in the now, as we might say. So he never thought in the future ever. No, I'm not saying he never thought in the future ever. But when he was present, which was whenever he was conscious, right, that was centered. Okay. And what happened later happened with him. And that's why he says, you know, Balak hires him and he says, listen, I need you to curse these people to come along with me. Blah, blah, blah. And all Bilam says, if God says it's okay. Right? What do you mean? Don't you know? If he says it's okay, we'll see what happens when we get there. And that's why, even there, the whole thing is, well, come see them from here. Well, why don't you come see them from here? We'll move over here. What are you over here? I'll tell you what's going to happen. Oh, okay, no, we'll see. Maybe there's something else we'll say over here. There were no assumptions for him. What's crazier is that he recognizes God is having no assumptions either. Why would he? So when I, it's a really strange thing, because, but when you realize this, you realize that the story is not strange at all. When you read the story without realizing the story, it's an extremely strange story. HaGadosh Baruch Hu comes to Bilam, right? The first night that the people, they said, who are, who are these people? What kind of question is that? Bilam should have said, aren't you God? Well, you ask me, who are these people? No, this is normal. Oh, well, these people, <coughs> there was a situation in Egypt, and they were coming out, and the Kisad and Aretz, and you know, Oh, okay. Yeah, don't go with them. says. They're blessed people. Balaam gets up in the morning. He says, uh, "No go. Sorry. Didn't get the green light. Can't go." Then it gets crazier because Balak sends new people over later. And you would think that Balaam should open the door and say, "What part of no did you not understand?" But that's not what he does. So okay, coming out. We'll see. Maybe he's changed his mind. I mean, that was that was last week. This week might be different. There's no telling. Why should I assume that what happened a week ago is what's going on now? Now is now. Last week was last week. Because there's sufficient might... there's sufficient evidence to assume. Why? Sometimes there is. Sometimes. A lot of times. A lot of times. I'm not saying that you're wrong. But it's still an assumption. Is, is it not? good to be like Bob? Is it good to think like that? It's never. I'm not saying that is good or bad. See what's happening? See what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Defining. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's, that's why I'm asking. I know, that. because you need to know whether it's good or bad. Yeah. Cause, cause, I, I'm saying suspend that for a moment. I'm suggesting that you suspend that for a moment, even though it's very uncomfortable for you to do so. And I can see, you know, you're sitting with your arms crossed. No, I'm, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm kidding. Right, but it is. I, I can admit, right? It would be uncomfortable for me to be you right now thinking about this as well, right? The only reason I'm not as uncomfortable as you is because I've been thinking about it for a little bit longer. That's all. It still makes me uncomfortable. It doesn't make sense to do that with God. Why not? Because Bilam is this great philosoph, probably would understand that God is outside the confines of time. And therefore, what was said in the past, it's not like it'll ever just go away, become irrelevant when the new present occurs. That what, what, what's in the past for God is present in the future as well, so it can't ever become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So you think that God's stuck? That what God says is always relevant. But that always. It would seem. Should we test that? It does make it weird that God would ask a question. Does it make it weird that God would destroy a world he created? It does, doesn't it? And yet, he does. Not only does he, he does it all the time, as far as Hazal is concerned. That's a weird thing, you know? We'll pause on that for a second. Let's, let's unpack this, yeah? It's really strange to talk about God this way, but you've heard, of course, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Boreo Lamotu Maharivan, right? It's Midrash, Midrash Really? Yeah. That should be the last thing that God should do. He doesn't just create our world and attempt to destroy it. This is the default for God, as far as Hazal is concerned. He just does this all the time. So can't we get one to work? I mean, you know, you would think if God is creating a world, we, it should work. Which is what you're saying about something he said. <coughs> right? 
even if God is changing his mind, it's not that he's actually changing his mind, it's just that it appears to be changing his mind. Oh, okay. Well, like that. Well, that's all that matters to us. Because it's all we've got. Mm -hmm. Or what appears to us. Right? I mean, what doesn't, I you know, you could sit and theorize what it is all you want. Now, there may be something, and it's quite important you're bringing this up, because it gets to the point, and I don't see a clock anywhere over here. I'm not, I'm not I'm not I'm not you. Oh, of course, convenient place. <laughs> <laughs> <For> you. <laughs> okay. Um, look, I want to I want to unpack that a bit, but I want you to hold with me for a minute. We're going to come back to that, okay? Because I want to finish out this point, and then we're we're going to deal with that. This is a very important part. We of course have to address that. Yeah. But to your thing, right? To to you thing, is it good or bad to do like Bilal? I'm saying hold that, right? Okay. For the specific reason of understanding Bilal. Because that very question is the whole point, right? The very fact that you need to know an answer to that question, <coughs> yeah, indicates that you want to have meaning to what it is that it indicates I want to do good. I wouldn't want to do bad. Right, right? you want to do if good. If someone is doing his bad, I don't want to do that. Right. I understand. He also did. Sure. You know, it's not like he was a he was a kamikaze pilot, right? Or he was a, he had a death wish. He believed this was the best way to live in the world. Right? Let's not pretend. He just didn't want to pretend. That was, and he understood that you know being here now is really the best way to live your life, because it's all you've got. That doesn't mean that there isn't a need for planning. It doesn't mean that there isn't a need to learn from past mistakes. No, I'm not saying that. But don't lose now for the concern of what is not yet. There's a difference between knowing about what could happen and living there. There's a difference between learning from past and living there in your head. You with me? Yeah? There's only one place that you are ever, and that's now. Right? So be here now. That's the point. That's all. And then the question can be, what do what does now mean to me? Yeah? So Bil Am, all I'm suggesting is that Bil Am was extremely hesitant to answer those questions. He didn't want to get into those questions. What he wanted to do with his life was to just observe what is coming up in consciousness. Just see what is happening. Experience what is going on. That is the most real. Anything other than that is going to be questionable in its reality. Because my definition on it may or may not be true. And what he found was his definitions on things were seriously untrue. And that was terribly devastating for him. Right? And we have to understand what that was. We don't know what it was yet. But that, that's So all I'm suggesting now is that he was not entirely wrong. And what I'm also suggesting is that we can learn a bit from him in this, yeah? To be able to recognize that if I want to be able to reach higher levels of existing, right, to be able to do better in my life, we've all agreed at the very beginning that my definitions of things, your definitions of things, are not always accurate. We also agreed at the beginning that having inaccurate definitions of things could be quite problematic. So we also agree that, therefore, it might be helpful to, to suspend my definitions of things and just see what is first before I make them. We all, we're, we're all on the same path. Yes, are you with me? You said yes, right? Remember that? Right, so that's what, that's all. That's what we're talking about. Now, now your, impi your impetus, right? Your need to then say, okay, we got that. Now is it good or bad? Right? Again, breathe, pause, step back. And hold. Right now, it is neither good nor bad. It just is what it is. I'm going to watch and see what it is. And what I'm saying is training your mind to be able to do that is highly valuable. Most people don't. And not only do most people don't, most people suffer because they don't. Because what we do instead is constantly define ourselves constantly identify with everything that is going on. It's always kore, 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 kore. Right? Again, it's one thing to call names to animals. It's another thing to call names to everyone and everything and every feeling and every experience and everything and have myself completely enmeshed in all of it. It drives me nuts. It drives you nuts if you're brave enough to admit it. Now, let's say that one gets to that point. Right? Let's say one has a, a higher level of being able to pause before defining. Is able to simply experience without calling it good, bad, or otherwise. 
Well, then you might be able to begin to say, what does this mean to me? Of course, the question would be, who's me? That's not for tonight. <laughs> but it's another question. Right? What does it mean to me? Who is you? Very important question. Because you think when you say me, you know who you're talking about, but we realize that we really don't know really who we're talking about when we say that. Because if you think you've got yourself all figured out, think again. Because if you're going to tell me, if you're going to sit here tonight and tell me that you don't surprise yourself sometimes, well then, come on. Got to be honest about that. Yeah. I mean, everybody surprises themselves one time or another, which means you don't 100% know yourself. Or you could be surprised at what it comes up with. <laughs> yeah? I mean, you've ever had this experience where you think something, you think, hmm, I wonder why I'm thinking that. Ever had that? Is it only me? I'm the only one? Hmm, that's an interesting thought. I wonder where that came from. Yeah? Yeah, it's part of the human experience. And you discover yourself more and more, the more that that, you know, and sometimes things come out and you think like, is that me? Ooh. Okay, good, so good. So the question is, fine. If we recognize that that is the basis for being able to think properly. And I told you, this is the Rambam's opening to Moreh Nebuchim. The Rambam says, the opening of Nebuchim, over and over again in many different ways, just because I think doesn't mean I think correctly. There's a difference between what I experience and what it is that I call So what do we do? Because we know that we're not like Bilam. I, mean, I don't have to, you don't need me to tell you. I'm not, this she does not say, we all need to be like Bilam, right? I'm not doing that, right? You get in a lot of trouble for that. It's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is Torah tells us about him for a reason. And it is valuable to be able to recognize who he is. It's very, very important to recognize that Hashem who talks to him. He's the only non-Israelite uh, Navi who calls God Adonai Elohai, right? Those are not insignificant things. Those are very important things to point out. The fact that Chazal say, this you all know. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, right? The fact that Chazal say that he rivaled Moshe Rabbeinu, right? The end of the Torah reminisces back to Milam. When it says, Lo kam be Yisrael nabi ke Moshe. You know this, right? This is the most famous midrash on the planet. Yeah, not, not ke Moshe, but ke Bil'am, but, yeah, but, but, but in Bilmot HaOlam, be Yisrael lo kam, Bilmot HaOlam kam, Bil'am ben Nebi Orjom. Comparing him to Moshe. So what I'm suggesting to you, there's some very important things we can learn from him. But we are not like him entirely. There's something that is fundamentally different. And what's indicated at the opening of our parasha is that Moshe is seeing himself as fundamentally different, but not a lot. Because look at that Aleph, right? I know there's a lot of drashot on this. A lot of drashot. What I'm suggesting is, no, this is important. He wants the Vaikar to be there prominently. <coughs> and the Aleph is small. Why? Because don't think that this is all just a Kriyat situation for Moshe. Now, he knows what Bilal's doing. He knows what's up. Because remember, Moshe Rabbeinu, one of his strong points is he knows what's up. That's what it means that he's humble. Right? His humility, his anava, and I said I was saying this to some of the guys that I, I sat with on Sunday. The Rambam writes this explicitly in a perush on in Masechet Pe'ah, in Mishnah. He says, anava is lashon ana, which simply means to respond. To be humble is to simply see what is and respond to it as it is, rather than what I think about it. The what I think about it has to come a lot later. So this, what I'm suggesting, is not exactly what everybody says. Everybody says, you know, it's really about No, this is, it needs to be prominent. Because it's only when this is prominent that the Aleph matters. If this is not prominent, then the Aleph is ruining everything. Because then it's just what you call it. Good, so who cares what you call it? You call it, call it whatever it is you want to call it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that what it's what it is. It has anything to do with what it is. No, the Vicar has to be very much. I see the occurrence. I see the happening. But when it goes a further step and says, I'm going to define the happening. Whoa! Right, so now the question for us is, and I, like I said at the very beginning, this is not complex. I'm really giving a very simple idea tonight.
for us, there is something that uh, establishes for us how we should call things. Or how you said how we should define things. And there is only one. There's only one criterion. And what is that criterion? Functionality? No. Although that's included. Right? So I'll read you. And this is it. Really, this is it. The only difference between us and Bilam, between Moshe for that matter, and the Vaikarai of Moshe and the Vaikarai of Lina Bilam, is what are the criteria that we use to define things in our lives, including the is it good for me and who is the me. Yeah? And this is just the halakha. I mean, this is the overarching halakha for all things. And, and the Rambam writes, writes it in the first note. I'll stand up. And he says simply, I'm sure you've heard the halakha before. This is in the third parak of Ilchot Da'ot. Tzorich adam sheyechaven kol ma'asav kulam. That's a strange language for the Rambam. Kol ma'asav kulam. It's not just poetic. But he keeps going. So he's being extremely emphatic here, right? Yeah, meaning there's no room for anything else. He's being extremely emphatic, profoundly explicit, and saying everything you do is for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is the Da'at Hashem Baruch Hu. Now, we'll talk about what that is, but that, that's it. And then he says, <laughs> You're standing and sitting, which means all of your physical circumstances. It's just a way of saying that. And diburo. And everything you speak. Which includes what? How you define things. Because definition is in language. We don't have another really one way to be able to do it so much, right? We, we use our language faculty to be able to do that. Hakol about everything has to be focused on that. And then he says ketzad. So now you would think, he says ketzad, which means how do I mean? Right, so what would you expect him to get into here? If he's talking about everything that you do, your language and your physical movements in life have to be to know God and nothing else. Ketzad. How do I mean? What's he going to do here? Give an example. What would an example look like? If someone's walking along the road. Mm -hmm. They meet a friend. Right. Or they see something. Good. They observe it. Yes. They use it in a way to know God. Right. right. So they should be thinking about God. Right? So basically, you would think that what the Rambam is going to do now is to give examples like Abner gave. Right? How do I keep God in my head in everything that I do? Except that's not what he does. What he does is, is talk about acts that we do and then define and then gives purposes for them. And the purposes are not directly related. They're indirectly related. Yeah. I have a question. Okay, so before we before the Rambam goes that that way, um, when he says to know Hashem, mm -hmm. I feel that we need to know what definition of God are is the Rambam using. You feel that? Or I need to know You need to know that. Like, if we're talking about knowing Hashem, right. we first need to, logically, we need to define what Hashem is to us in that context. Granted, let's say we know. Let's say we know, right, who God is. What he's saying is, is that my entire perspective in the world needs to be knowing God. Now, why is that different than Bilam? What does he mean in here to know God? Is he talking about some academic knowledge of what God is? Did Bilam not know that? Experience. No, he's not talking about that. He's not talking about that. What he's talking about is, ha is having some level of connection to God, right? In other words, my knowledge of God is also my relationship and connection to God. We see that throughout the Torah, yeah? In the most concrete terms, be'adam yada'a ha'va'ishto, right? But it's all, these are all questions of how it is that I have my connection to God. That Bilam did not have. I know this Bil'am did not assume that there should be this. Because this assumes what? 
that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is quote unquote interested in being known and that we should be interested in knowing Him in terms of having some kind of connection. Connection is the key, not academic knowledge. As far as academic knowledge, Bilam knew what God was, which is why he you know, dealt with God the way he did, and he went about his life exactly as one would expect, as we would expect anybody in the world today to go about their lives. Right? Okay, it's good. Why, why should they do anything other than that? The question is, what is the best way for you to live? The best way for you to live is to recognize what is, to recognize what is, to be able to have a recognition of what's happening and understand them that way, not to give wrong definitions onto things because you can get in trouble. That's it. But there's something added over here, and that's something that's added for us, and that is that for some reason, we have this idea that we should have a relationship with God. And that is only is there because of Abraham Avinu. In other words, you think, what is the one thing that Abraham Avinu taught his kids? Not just about God, which is, by the way, why the Hachamim compare Abraham to Balaam and Berkeley. Right? Got to compare them. Let's go back. That's, that's the question. That's the difference. And all of it is a question of whether one finds oneself in relationship with God or not. So if the nature of your life is that relationship, which it seems for Abraham Avinu it was, and this goes to your question, right, which is, doesn't God say last forever? And the answer is no. Clearly, unless he says this is going to last forever. Right? Which is an important thing because God's got to do that. Because otherwise there's no reason why he needs to last forever because he's God and he can do whatever he wants. And doing whatever he wants means he can change his mind. Could you imagine if he couldn't? Then he'd be stuck, wouldn't he? And then that would be problematic. Except if he wants to be stuck. I'm borrowing the terms here because we're talking about God. But nonetheless, right? Let's, uh, if he wants to be stuck. If he wants to be stuck, then he says, listen, I'm going to do this and I'm not changing my mind. Well, then no, he's not changing my mind. Because he's saying, I'm not changing my mind. What does he do for Abraham in that, in that nature, in that way? Bris. What is it? Bris. Yes, Breed. Which is why, in our whole way of thinking, Breed is central. It's the only thing that separates us from living like Bilam. Otherwise, we should just be living like him. It's the most viable way to live. The only thing that makes a difference is the greed. And for whatever reason, the Kadosh Baruch Hu established one. With Abraham, that's our, that's our Mesorah, right? That's, that's what makes us, us. Nothing else, really. That's what we call greed Abraham Abinu. Incidentally, is that greed a philosophical system? No, not primarily. How does that breed manifest? Action. No, also law. not. What is it? A code of law. No, no, not a code of law. The breed of Abraham Avinu is what? Behavior. It's in, it's in the people. It's the people. These people. And how does that manifest today? You know the halacha. If a person's mother is Jewish, child is Jewish. Does this child need to keep anything in order for that child to remain within Brit of Ram Avinu? Does the child need to know anything? No. As a matter of fact, theoretically speaking, go on this little thought experiment with me, right? Let's say this child <coughs> knew absolutely nothing about Judaism, about God, about Torah, about anything. And this person, you know, let's say it's a male. Right? And this person fell in love with a Jewish uh, woman and wanted to marry this woman. Do we perform the wedding? I'm talking about halakha. I'm not saying whether I want my daughter or not. Why is that, right? Would we, is there a problem halakha performing the wedding? Zero. Did you have to do anything? No. Wait, say, listen, it might be good to learn a little bit about you, you know, if that's what they want. Are the kiddushin tofsim? Kiddushin tofsim. Now let's say on, I have a person who's not of a Jewish mother and knows everything. I know people like this, right? They know Shas, they know Jewish philosophy, they know all, everything, right? They give great, give you a great shiur, right? And they want to marry. No go. You have to become a member of the body of Israel. And that's why when they go into the mikveh, 
their biological relationships dissolve in the mikveh, halachically. Right? So there's this crazy halacha that if a brother and sister who are not Jewish convert, their biological relationship dissolves. And theoretically speaking, they can marry each other. And kiddushim tofsi. Chazal said, it doesn't look good. We shouldn't do that. But kiddushim tofsi, they would need to get it. That's preposterous if the entire thing is some philosophy or some code of law, but it's not some philosophy and some code of law fundamentally. Fundamentally, it's the people. The Brit resides in the people, the children of Abraham, Tzach, and Yaakov. There's something about the people, and there's a relationship that HaKadosh Baruch Hu establishes with the people, and he says, I'm going to lock myself in, which in, in itself is preposterous, but nonetheless. I mean, we're here, aren't we? We really shouldn't be. I mean, as us, you know, with all the problems that the Jews have and all of the things that we shouldn't be doing, whatever, you know, bottom line, we're here. Talking about ourselves as descendants of Abraham Avinu, as we have for the last 3,000 years, that's nuts. And here we are. So there's some element of that, right? One could recognize it as a farce. I'm not using that as a hardcore proof. All I'm saying is it's a little weird, right? That that's what was established all the way back then, and here we are. And that's great, okay, so there it is. But that's what it is. In other words, in our Mesora, the way that we relate to the world and have related to it, for the majority of our history as Israelites on this planet, is that Abraham established, or with God, Abraham, there was established a breed, which was essentially a locking in of attention of relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That was developed further at Sinai, where there was a further breed established, which included a code of law, right? You know, and it's good to be able to keep that. It's important, that's part of the breed, right? But it's a developed breed. It's a breed with Abraham's children that's already established. You with me? That's the difference. And it is the only difference. So for us, the only question is, well, okay, listen, you need the Vaikar to be prominent. We all do. Because otherwise we get off into Avodazara problems and all kinds of issues. And even if it's not Avodazara, we're just looking at a world that doesn't exist. And we live in that. Ah, great. It's better to be like Bilam. And add the Aleph. Because what the Aleph adds is the ability to start speaking and defining a world in terms of Abraham Avinu and the Torah that his children were given, and the principles that Moshe Rabbeinu taught us. And what Harabban is saying is all of that is only one thing, it's Ladat Tashem Whatever, however it is that that manifests. How does that manifest? You have to work out, and it means that you have to eat well, and it means all that. Why? Because you can't really have a good, functional, conscious relationship if you're sick, and you're not well, and all of that. So it trickles down to, not I have to work out because it's spiritual and holy. No, it's not necessarily spiritual or holy in and of itself. But it's helpful to you in order to be able to have a good functional relationship with God. And that's how everything in your life should be defined. What, even the question of who am I? Yeah, okay, who are you? You can think about yourself in terms of that context. The relationship with God founded on what principle? The principle that it doesn't matter what you believe, just as long as you belong to this, this body of the Jewish people? No, that's not what I said. I said that it starts simply in the people. It develops at Sinai. And at Sinai, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, here is a framework for you. You live in this framework. You have the best of, uh, chances of connecting with me. And I have the best chances of connecting with you. It's not just a one-way street. That is our belief. That is how Israel runs in the world. And that's the difference between the Vaikara and the Vaikara. Did you hear that? Yeah, so, that's, so then you can start, you know, look at all the books. You know, then you can really start unpacking it and, and, and thinking in all of the nuances and so on. But at the end of the day, there has to be a constant re-examining and questioning of how is this Ladat et Hashem Baruch And if it's not that, then we're veering. And then it's, well, either be like Bilam or be like Moshe. <coughs> And they're not necessarily contradictory when you have the recognition of the Aleph for us is not just some arbitrary calling, not just some arbitrary definition. 
Because the truth of the matter is the definitions themselves are terribly dubious. Almost always. We're very lucky when we find a definition that really works, which is why in science they're so careful to call the definitions laws. They don't like doing that, right? They'll hold, they'll hold. We'll call it a theory, even though everything points to this, and we all of the experiments seem to look this way, and we can predict future occurrences that actually work, and we can build technologies. Still, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's be humble, right, and respond to what's going on. And if things change, then you know, change. But that's that's the only difference. Yeah. When is the suspension of judgment uh, not necessary? I mean, not necessary. Because you spoke about suspending your judgment, but uh, that's not the same as nullifying it's the judgment. It's always, always important to start that way. So it's interesting, because in the year, what is the Moed that we have that is just observing? Tisha B'Av. It may have better uh, uh, overtures to it later on in time. You know, who knows? I don't know. But right now, that's what it is. And it's a time where we strip away all of our comforts so that we do not overlay onto what's going on anything other than what is core going on. And that's it. <coughs> that's what the whole yom. And so that precedes the Day of Judgment, right? It precedes Rosh Hashanah. So I'm in a place, I start it with what's happening. Not comforts, not what I feel like. Now, what I, that's why it's important also to train your language because it's a very modern way of saying I also do it, but I try not to do it very much. When you say, I feel like, and then say something that you think about a fact. Don't do that. Right? Everybody does that. But don't try not to do that. Right? Because, again, language is important and how you see it. So is it how you feel? Or is it how you think? And if it is how you feel, then say, I feel. Right? But be careful about how it is. That, so with regards to that, Tisha B'Av is a day in which I strip away all of the comforts and live in what is, and look at it. Look at it, right? See it, see what's there. So now Tisha B'Av happens to be a time where what we see is not pleasant. It may end up being a time where we look at it is pleasant, but whatever it is, that's the nature of the day. The Ben Chai has a great, his, he wrote Perush on Echa. And it's a phenomenal perush. It's a very, very creative perush. He wrote a perush on Megillat Echa as if Echa was written for the Binyan Bet Amitash rather than the destruction of Bet Amitash. And he's Doresh the entire Megillah in terms of Tikkun rather than, than uh, Chorban. Yeah? It's, it's Don't read it on Tisha B'Av. It's interesting. Yeah? And then, when you go through that time, you can come to the Yom Haddin in a much more realistic way. Right? Even with regards to the Yemei Tshuva themselves, how important is Vidui? It's central to the whole day of Yom Kippur. And what is Vidui? Just saying, this is what I did. Well, how do you feel about that? Well, okay, I mean, we can talk about that, but it's more important to say, this is what I did rather than, I feel this way about it. You can talk about that after Yom Kippur, also, right? You can start addressing it and dealing with it, and whatever it is. But Yom Kippur is a time to say, this is what I did, hatati, right? Those aspects are extreme. And those are Bilam type aspects. It's, this, it's lavdil. It's similar to Bilam saying, I can only do what it is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells me to do. I can only say what it is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells me. And it's funny, because when he's going, I mean, who says, don't say anything that I don't tell you to say. So there's, there's this interesting uh, window over there, right? That, uh, yeah. But nonetheless. So now, of course, I leave you with this, and you say, well, what is, it that, what is knowing God? Right? Well, that's the rest of your life. You know, that you can do in other times. And, you know, that, that, but like I said, this is, just, this is a class on, on a broad principle. But it helps, like I said at the very beginning, this is for me, and I'm just sharing it with you helps me to orient. So when I know that I have this question that needs to essentially be with me at all times, it helps me to question. It helps me before I start defining. I think of the definitions. So even when it comes to something like defining an emotion, it isn't always helpful in my Da'at Hashem for me to be wallowing in depression. 
Some people can't help it. Some people really, really struggle. But if I can, it's not always helpful for me. It's also not always helpful for me to be in a state of elated happiness. Because I sometimes lose my footing and my grounding. In it. That's one of the reasons why the Hachamim say, watch out being the malib schopi What does that mean? I shouldn't laugh and have fun and enjoy. No, that's not what it means. It means just keep your footing. Gilu birada. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you have to walk around like a, a monk. It means that you just keep your consciousness about you. Don't fully identify with everything that is happening as though this is all that is and you have now defined it as it is. That's not saying don't feel your emotions. No, feel them. But observe them. Observe the feeling. Before you automatically decide, and this is what it means. We're not 100% sure what it means. And that's why, and I'll end with this, the being in the now is extremely valuable. And so I was saying again to the boys on Sunday, a very beautiful perush of the Rabbah on the Mishnah and Brachot, in Pirek Tet. So the Hachamim say, Chayav Adam Lebarech Al Tova, Shem Shem Lebarech Al Ra, you have to say Barech Al Tova, and Ra, and then you should say Barech Al Tova, Ma'in Ra, Ra, Ma'in Tova. And so Harambam asks a very simple question. He says, well, how do I know that if I say Baruch Dayan HaEmet on this thing, and it may end up getting better, right? In other words, this particular occurrence that I say something terrible may end up bringing great things to me in my life, right? How many times do people talk about, oh, you know, I look back at that terrible time, you know, I, it changed me so much for the good, and I helped it. Okay, good. So then maybe you shouldn't say Dayan HaEmet. Or vice versa. Maybe I'm going to say Hatov HaMetiv on a wonderful thing that happens to me right now and I realize it ends up playing out in not so great situations. So the Rambam writes a very important and basic point in his version. He says, yeah, but all you've got is what's now. And you don't know what's going to be. What you know is what's now. And then that is where you take God's name, Nebracha. And you can say it in terms of what's happening now. And you're fully allowed to do that. It's proper to speak about now as how it is that it is seen now. Is a bracha a definition? This one? Well, kind of. All you're looking at is saying, well, this is what's going on. Are you saying that as bad? Yes, you are. You are. Because that's your experience of it. But you're not falling in a hook, line, and sinker. You're saying, yes, this is what it is now. And I'm going to say a bracha and recognize this. Okay. I think I guess, if, is there, do we want to do any questions? Go on. Yeah? Yeah. Did, we, did, we, did we say, um, we said Leilu Nishmat Murabat Reina. Yes. So, if I'm wrong, you're basically saying that the the Vayikar is almost like the baby cow, right? So that's why it is. There, it's, it's the fundamental. Base. The other provides that Hashem and almost like a framework to understand it. And it's operate. a mode of defining. Right. Right. So yeah. So what what advantage what advantage does that have in in reality and practice that it doesn't that the doesn't have by itself? Like is it like yeah? A that's more a very good question. Right? Here's the question. Here's the question that, that yeah. If I understand your question correctly, you're saying what value does the Kriya have that the Vaikar of, of, of Bilam doesn't have in itself? Or another way of saying that is why do I ever need to define? Why don't I just always observe the world as it is? Yeah. And the answer to that is you end up living detached. And what the Kriya does for you is it gives you a connection to what's going on. Because imagine living in the world only as an observer all the time and never really having anything to do with what's going on. Right, this is why Zen is very much about detachment, right? staying attached. What they do, they just detach. <laughs> what Torah does is say, no, 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 you, get the, you can attach, but attach to me, like Adosh Baruch Hu is saying. Right? In other words, attach to things through your attachment to me. Let that be the only way that you attach. Otherwise, unattachment is better than attaching something else. And that's the atema dvekim madonai lechem chayim kolchem, right? As opposed to being davik to something other than that. Don't be davik to anything other. Better to stay, to remain unattached. That's essentially what Torah is saying. And that's why it's valuable. 
And that's why it's an issue of dot, because the whole issue of dot is being able to have this relationship connection. Very, very important. Thank you for that. Very good question.